So perhaps just to begin the session, um, could we just have Kwemlin and Pras to give a short introduction about who you are and kind of what you do here at ID? Maybe we start with Kwemlin. Sure. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. So my name is Clement, and I am actually a DID alumni myself. Uh, graduated from the program in 2012. And then uh, after graduation, I've, I got really interested in the area of uh, HCI, human computer interaction. So I was doing research in the area, um, also teaching in the area. And then I went abroad to, to pursue my further studies. And I was also uh, continuing my research and uh, teaching at you know different institutions in the US. Um, and then finally in 2020, I returned to um, to NUS to Singapore. Uh, and so my whole family's back, and I've been um, teaching and also researching. Right, the two kind of go hand in hand for me uh, for the last two years. Yeah. Um, so glad to be back, and yeah, glad to chat with uh, all of you today. Thanks, uh, Pras, any short introduction by yourself? Yeah, hi, um, I'm Pras. Um, I'm a year three student currently at DID. Um, currently doing an internship at Grab. Um, I like to do product design, which involves like UI UX, um, also like interaction design. Um, yeah, happy to answer any questions that y'all might have too. Yeah. Okay, uh, I also see Karina. We have popped in special guest Karina, are you there? I, I'm not. Hi. Yeah, we're gonna put her on the spot. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. I, I, wait, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Hi, Karina. So, are you joining us for the the entirety of today? Uh, I don't think so. But <laughs> okay, I just, okay. I, I just came here to annoy Pras, and then I didn't expect it to be such an intimate session. <laughs> Okay, but I mean, if, if you're if you're available to stay for a little bit to answer any questions, maybe you could just give a short introduction about uh, who you yeah, are. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Karina. I just graduated last year, and I'm currently working at Open Government Products, which is a part of Graphic. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, maybe, and I guess for everyone's information, uh, Ben and I, Desiree, we're also here in the call. Um, we're both alumni of the school and uh, we're currently teaching assistants uh, in, in NUS itself. So, um, yeah, I guess to, to begin, we can address uh, Vivi's question that was posted quite early on uh, regarding pay. <laughs> so she's asking, you know, why, why did the median pay of the ID graduates increase quite sharply um, in the survey conducted this year? And yeah, Clement, do you have any insight into that? Um, some insight, lots of questions myself. Um, so I, I, I think I want to start by just uh, putting up a big disclaimer, which is that the, the GES survey that you see, um, not just for industrial design, but for you know, all programs uh, in, in, in NUS or even uh, in the rest of uh, Singapore, right? Um, it, it really depends on the market climate, um, uh, the situation of Singapore, the job industry, also who decides to fill out the survey, right? So it, it's really dependent on if our graduates decide to fill out the survey and the results that you see are highly dependent on, um, yeah, on, on that response. So uh, I think it's a good benchmark. I think, I think it's some indicator of the, of the market, right, and, and the industry. Um, but at the same time, it's not like uh, the full picture. So I, I just want to open with this big disclaimer um, as to how we should be looking at this data, right? Um, on, on that note, however, um, I think, for for me and, and for those of us on the teaching side of uh, at DID, I think we have definitely observed how um, the, the Singapore market for designers has really been uh, growing, uh, and and particularly in the area of um, UI UX. And actually, a more interesting uh, source of data to look at um, alongside this uh, GES survey, right? And I'm not sure if, if Benjamin or Desiree, you have it on hand. Um, Design Singapore, which is kind of like one of the really uh, central bodies uh, in, in our 
in our government that, that is looking at design as an industry. All right, so Design Singapore, that's, uh, I think they are housed under MTI, they actually launched a uh, manpower survey right, about the landscape of design and, and, and what kind of jobs are there uh, for designers. right? And, and I think that that report actually gives a really interesting glimpse into how design is really shifting into areas like uh, UI UX, right? VV, I think you mentioned that. Um, so definitely, I think that's a big hire and that's an a industry that is rapidly growing. I think it's, it's really mature in Singapore right now and I think it, it will just continue to grow. Um, and, and also newer industries kind of like in, in let's say like service design, right? Or, or strategy design. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, so that, that was kind of a long segue, but um, to, to answer the question directly now, uh, my my hunch, my slightly informed hunch, is that uh, the Singapore design industry is really maturing in the area of UI UX, uh, as well as other um, kind of, uh, I would say, parallel design industries, right, such as in the service sector, in the banking sector, right, or, or even design for business, like so more like strategy design. I think all of these things are maturing, and these um, hire these employers. Um, uh, are, are really starting to see the value of design and are starting to hire very aggressively designers and are also able to compensate a lot um, for like a better a lot better than than maybe more traditional uh, design industries that perhaps we see ten years ago and and that's what has been I, I would attribute the the kind of climb in the uh, kind of salary of designers uh, to to that yeah and I think um, it. Yeah, but it, it is it is interesting to us as well that it was quite a sharp increase uh, between last year and this year. Yeah, thank uh, you. And mm. yeah, Desiree posted the link. So so that that is actually a super interesting article if you have not seen it and you're interested in studying design. So do look at it. Mm. Yeah, and and um yeah, I was about to say that th yeah, thanks for sharing that, Clement. And actually, Ben and I had a mini discussion about this with John also. Uh, we were like, oh, how come I like so? It's 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 uh surprising, right? And from Don's perspective, it's kind of also a possibility that it's because some of our graduates may be more preferring to go into full time UX jobs as opposed to previously when I guess the industry wasn't as mature. Some of the graduates go into like startups and things like that, and those are usually, yeah, skews the 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 numbers a bit lower or they're not accounted for like, in in the survey. So that's also another mm -hmm. guess, yeah, as to why. Yeah, um, that's, I mean, Desiree, that's such a good point. I, I think uh, we, for a survey like this, we tend to miss maybe um, the, the nuances of like people who decide to be their own boss, right? Who, who decide to go and be entrepreneurs or decide to help with a startup with, with their friends from uni, right? We, we know actually our graduates who are like, Bent out and, and start their own startup and, and are just like taking, really making full use of their youth, I would say. Uh, so uh, yeah, a, a survey like the GES does, it, does not take those things into account, actually. Hmm, okay. I hope uh, that answers your question, Vivi. And um, yeah, at any point, uh, please feel free to put in any questions, okay? If you, are, if you wish to stay anonymous, you can also uh, privately message your question to either me or Benjamin. Okay, so while we await for more questions, maybe we can, um, I can ask a, a question on behalf of, I guess, a generic student. And um, yeah, to, to play on to Clement's strengths, right, in, in tinkering, in case you don't know. Um, yeah, when Clement mentioned about being interested in human-computer interaction, um, yeah, he has a knack for like anything that requires tinkering with your hands. Lah. So uh, if I'm a type of student, you know, who's like a bit interested, interested in tinkering, a bit interested in um, like some, some parts of engineering, uh, but at the same time also a bit of design, would you be able to describe what may be some things that I get to learn in DID in this realm? Right. Um, uh, wow. Okay. So let's see. Uh, there. I, I'm trying to think about um, what is the 
approach I want to tackle this question because there's so many ways. Maybe, maybe um, given that many of the people here today are uh, potential, like are interested perhaps in, in the program and would be coming in from year one, uh, let me uh, address that question from a more curricular standpoint. So, so I think um, our curriculum is, is really quite uh, unique uh, in, in NUS. Um, and so in our fundamental uh, year, our year one, what we have actually done is to really divide up um, what we think are uh, core skills and ways of thinking into six week uh, modules. So they're actually kind of mini modules. They do not take up a full semester, right? And so in these mini modules, um, different uh, tutors will, will take charge of, of the different modules and you will be exposed to like different things, right? And so for example, uh, the, mod, uh, the mini module, fundamentals module that I had a hand in designing is um, called electronics as material. And so in that mini module, in that six weeks, um, students actually get to learn physical computing, uh, which is a fancy way of uh, basically saying like tinkering with electronic platforms such as the Arduino, right? Which some of you might be, might have heard of. Um, and uh, not so much, you know, to, um, and, and, and really directing it towards interaction design, right? So. So kind of learning Arduino, learning physical computing, and then looking at how we can make, uh, we can design interactions uh, or, or interfaces on top of it. And so for that particular electronics as material mini module, um, what we get students to do is to build a game controller, right? For the classic uh, game. And this is probably way before all of your time, uh, Snake, right? So, so essentially you have this thing that's going on the screen eating uh, pixels, right? And then it grows longer. But everyone is given the same game, but everyone has to design a different controller. And so we kind of uh, culminate, this six weeks culminate in a game festival. Um, but imagine going to a game festival where the game is the same. Everyone is presenting the same game. The catch is that all the controllers are different, right? And all of these controllers are unique and that's what makes the game different. And uh, and all these controllers are functional and they're functional because uh, under the hood, right? Students have learned how to uh, make them work with, uh, with an Arduino. So, so that is just like a snapshot of one of the things that you would do in year one. Um, and then down, down, the, down the road, you know, further on in the program, uh, we move into uh, what we call studio classes, which we call design platforms. And this is, these platforms are topical, which means that uh, students really get to Pick, uh, pick and choose like their own curriculum. And usually every semester we have about 10 to 15 to even 20 topics and students pick two. Um, and that is where, you know, we start to see students uh, have different strategies. Some students want to specialize, some students really want to um, try everything, right? And among all of those things, like for, for instance, what uh, the kind of platforms that I champion, that I lead, uh, tend to be like what Desiree was saying, um, a mix of uh, computing for design, as well as uh, interaction design, as well as tinkering with, with materials. Um, yeah, and so that's kind of a glimpse into our curriculum. Um, I'm also going to put a plug in here right now for our open day, open house day this Saturday, right? Um, where if you come down, right, uh, and I think you need to book tickets, but if, if you do come down, we would actually have a lot of student projects on display. And in fact, a lot of the uh, interaction design uh, works that, that I have facilitated, that my students have created, will be also on display for you all to interact with. So do come down, um, yeah, if you have the time. Uh, I'm not sure actually if Pras and Karina wants to add anything to that. Yeah, do y'all want to share any project or any any yeah any visual videos or share your experience with taking any of Clement's project modules? Uh let Karina go first. No, no, no. I was gonna say prospect. <laughs> <laughs> so we've done we've done well, the same are, project. So doing, the same yeah, thing. they're doing this again, right? But okay, so so history uh, uh trivia. Uh, Pras and Karina were part of the same group that took um a platform that I ran uh. I guess it's two years ago now, which is crazy. Um, 
And in that uh, platform, we were looking at augmented reality, right, and computer vision. And so Pras and Karina and, and, and one other group mate, UNCA, right, the three of them uh, were really interested in how uh, essentially anything could be turned into a controller and used to control your, your, uh, your computer, uh, such as a game on a computer, right? So imagine grabbing a ring, right? Um, and then uh, using computer vision to turn that into a steering wheel and playing Mario Kart with it, right? So that's, that was one of the, pro one of the ideas that, that they had. So um, yeah, they did that. Uh, I'm not sure if I said too much or if there's nothing else left to say, but do you want to add anything on top of that? Maybe, uh, maybe sh should I pause here for a moment and for good measure, just play the video so everyone gets yeah. a better idea of um, what that is. Okay, give me a Yeah, I think it'd be great. Yeah. While I dig out the link for the video. Okay, so this is the project, it's called Aru Controls, and uh, yeah, it's quite a pretty exciting video, so please enjoy. I'm Karina. And I'm Pross. And I'm Yun Jie. Okay, so instead of watching their pre recorded comments, maybe Pross and Karina, you want to chip in something about that project? Uh, yeah, um, that was like my first platform project. Um, so, with this thing called Vertical Studio, right, where year two is going to work with year threes and year fours. Um, so, not just year two and year four. Um, and I Sign up for the project at first because I thought that the brief was pretty cool. But I think when I first entered, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, I just thought it was a bit of making a bit of like coding with like the uh with, with the ARU code markers and I wanted to like try it out. Uh, I didn't knew Yuanzhe. He was in, in my year, and we just kind of formed the group with Karina. Um, and I think the process was really very fun for me. Um mainly because uh, we got to really experiment and try out um, how we could transform a simple everyday object um, into something that can be recognized by computer vision just by adding that graphic marker to it, right? So, um, but that being said, I also wanna say that it's not, that we don't just do like so, so much of tech related products in ID. Uh, there's like a huge range. Um, it could be completely conceptual. It could be completely practical. Um, yeah, just want to like leave that as like a side note there too. Yeah. Uh, Karina, you can add on to that project. How was the experience? Uh, yeah, so actually that was my last platform. <laughs> like that was Pass's first platform, that was my last. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting how we use like very everyday objects like people and like 
cardboard to to com- like almost make it computational and like have a like computational response from such a low fi material. So that was like the most interesting thing for me is like kind of like merging like the physical realm with the digital realm. Um, and I also thought that like this project taught me a lot about uh, like communications when it comes to communicating interaction design because like you realize that it's so hard to use like words or like static images to communicate what you're doing. I saw I think like a big learning point for me was like how how do you communicate like the idea of like gesture or haptic feedback through like a video or like through whatever other medium you can like communicate that with. I think that was like a big learning point for me uh, for this platform, which was which was quite interesting. Yeah. And I think that was only like I could only learn that through like the idea of learning about interaction design uh, through this platform. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that is really just one one snippet la, of one type of project out of the many different types of domains that are available in DID. Um, okay, so uh, Ben, do you have any questions on your side at the moment? No, do I have no one, no one probably messaged me. Okay, on my end also, no. So students, please don't feel shy okay, to ask any question that can be completely um, uh, irrelevant or so in your head, doesn't matter. <laughs> any questions are all welcome, okay? And the admission process or like or the, the courses that's offered, is there any changes when we like uh, merge with uh, CD? Yeah, I think those are the kind of like, common questions that we get from the previous few sessions. Hmm. Oh, okay. We have a question about the admissions, I think. So about what is the approximate time for that the students would be given to upload the video for the interview round? Ben, do we know this information? Um, I do not have the exact time, um, but it's, it's in the hours. Yeah, so you're given a task and you're supposed to um to perform the task, like be it recording of a your own uh, uh, take on a certain issue or a certain topic. And then after that, you upload that video onto a platform. So um, I don't have the specific timing uh, with me now, but yet we are talking about in a few hours time. I, I believe also because of the platform that we're using, you can re-record, right? Um, your response. Uh, like if, if you if you didn't if you feel like you didn't really speak something clearly or, or you want to edit what you said, you can actually re-record uh, within within quite a generous amount of time uh, until you feel like you're satisfied with with your response. Yeah. And for small students who have like portfolio that you wish to uh, submit uh, for the for the teachers or the professors to to uh, better understand what, is, what are some of your capabilities, you can do so by saving the link into a, into a, like a text file, and then you can upload the text file onto the platform during the, the interview process. Hmm. Thanks for that, uh, Ben. Okay, we have one more question in the chat about how intimidating is the first year for students with no design experience? Pras and Karina, you want to think back to your first year, and maybe share whether uh, or not you have you had you came in with design experience. Uh, I can go first. Um, I was from JC. I took biochem maths econ, so it's like no design. Um, and I mean initially I did want to do medicine. Um, but I did come across this course. And is it industrial design? And at the open day, I saw those super cool like student projects and how some of them were even like healthcare related um and that students had the liberty to like really experiment and try uh different iterations and different briefs um to like help people out um i think that's what kind of captured me um and when i did enter i would say initially was a bit scary because uh there were some other like uh kids from poly who already knew how to like uh, use certain softwares or like having some design background. Um, but I would say that the course is structured such that the first year allows you to catch up in whatever design skills that you did not previously have. Or like, because you get to learn all the hard skills by, by yourself, right? Like Photoshop or Illustrator. Um, and I think by the first sem, um, I think I, I would 
I would think at least that I kind of caught up. Um, but I think that would, um, but I wouldn't say it was intimidating in any sense. I would say that the process was fun, so I can just enjoy learning all those kind of things. Yeah. I couldn't get add on because currently nothing from JC too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I came from JC also, and I took history, econs, and lit. So it's like humanities, but also not design related. Um, and I also didn't have any other like design background. Uh, I wouldn't say it's intimidating because like every like all the profs treat students like on the same level. It's not like just because you have like even art, if you, even if you have art background, I don't think it really gives you like any leverage. Uh, so everyone starts from the same place, and um, yeah, it, it's not intimidating. I think just some of the exercises that we do or the curriculum might be a bit more unconventional as compared to what you're used to in school because we have a lot of like hands-on learning and um, like hands-on making, which might not which might not be like what people are used to. Um, but it's not into it. I, I, the way I saw that it was more fun. La. So I guess it really depends on how like open-minded you are to like try new ways of learning and thinking. Um, yeah, but it's it's not intimidating. You, you might just be doing a lot of things that um, you, that doesn't really feel like academic conventionally. Yeah, that, 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 that's my opinion. <laughs> and then you want to chip in from teacher's perspective on the first year? Um, yeah, so I, I think from, from our end, we definitely design all of the first year classes with uh, expecting that, that all of you are coming in with no prior experience. Yeah, so um, it's it's really not. Um, I mean, I, I I wouldn't say it's not important because I don't want to dissuade the people with design experience from coming in as well. But point is, I think that uh, you will find a way, right? Um, and so personally, I'm, I'm a science student. I, I came in as a science student as well, and and um, looking back, right uh, after so many years, I realized that um, I took what I loved the most about science, and I. And I found a way to apply it to design, right? And then even to the arts for some of the more artistic projects that I've done. So um, there, there is always, I think design is so broad right now and, and um, don't worry about what you come in with. And also, yeah, first year is designed to be, to, to, to be um, a level playing field, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think thanks for those um, responses. I completely concur also as a complete science student from JC when I came in and I saw video uh, photos of seniors like sending stuff like sending styrofoam and wood by the by the side of the drain <laughs> and I was like oh my goodness and th at, at this point I had already accepted the offer and I was like oh my goodness what did I sign up for and then that was my very first um, impression of what uh, ID is really about and then of course uh, I got through the whole thing, enjoyed myself, and, and still here yeah, in, in design. Yeah, okay, so next question from Ting. Uh, how will the interview be conducted and what will be the process like? Maybe Ben or Clement, do you want to just very briefly share the flow of things? I'll, I'll let Ben handle this, actually. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, so there's actually three components to this uh, interview process. So uh, that's why I briefly mentioned about the, the portfolio review portion. But then uh, do not worry, if you have the portfolio, um, then you can submit it. Um, if it's an uh, online uh, submission, like you, have, you know, you have a website about your photography or something like this, but you can just submit the URL into a text file, save it in a text file, and then submit the text file later on. But if yours is like a PDF soft copy, right? You can just upload the soft copy uh, directly onto the platform. So that's the portfolio review part. Um, next is the design exercise. So um, you, you'll be given a task to perform. And then um, you, if I'm not wrong, it's an online, uh, uh, sorry, it, it is both an online and also a physical uh, test. So you're supposed to perform some design exercise. And then after that, upload this, uh, this thing onto the platform. So it's a soft copy submission. And, you have to do it within the stipulated time frame. And then last but not least, it's a kind of like a self-introduction uh, interview thing that you have to do. So we will be kind of like releasing a series of questions and then you will be 
answering those questions through a self-recording of your of yourself. And then uh, you have to do do it do all of this within a stipulated time frame as well. So all in all, there's three sections. <clears throat> Thanks, Ben. Okay, next question from BV. Can an ID graduate go into fields of marketing or management? So basically kind of completely non-designed fields. Clement, any thoughts? Um, I mean, I personally had, had uh, classmates um, as well as I know of people who both my seniors and, and, and from batches below me that definitely went into uh, kind of marketing or management related uh, fields. Um, I mean, quite, quite, quite different. I think marketing is marketing management is kind of management. Um, for, for management, I think actually a lot of our uh, alumni who, um, who go into a certain industry as designers, but as they gain more experience in the industry, they, they transitioned into, into uh, like a managerial leadership position within that, that company or within that industry. Um, and, and so that feels almost like a, a natural progression of things if, if you stick to a particular industry, actually. So I would say that a lot of our graduates right now are in the management positions uh, after, after a few years. Um, in terms of marketing, uh, actually, I, I want to say that uh, I, I know so I know of my some of my friends, my classmates from ID that went into marketing, and actually, a lot of the things that you pick up at the ID in, in design school are also really relevant to marketing. So specific to marketing, actually, I, I personally see a very strong connection between those two fields, um, because you know uh, I, I guess industrial design uh, more conventionally is really um, to support uh, to support like manufacturing to support um, you know the, the, the selling of consumer goods right and so um, even if you are a designer uh, and, and stick to being a designer I think you actually work very closely with marketing in a more conventional consumer goods company as well yeah so I uh, hope that addresses the question Thanks, Carmen. Okay, so uh, next question is uh, from, from Danik, who is asking about the, I guess, how we define what product design is, right? Like what really is a product? So because coming from a, a poly background in, in product design, right? Um, the typical definition is product design is really a physical product. Lah. But now as the UI UX kind of, uh, field is more is growing in prominence then now it seems as though when we talk about product design the product can also be a, a non-physical intangible kind of object so um, yeah Simon, do you have any thoughts on, on, on this I don't know like what why, why this shift or what's the difference when designing for physical product versus a mm. intangible product yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's really what designers, what we are putting up on the shelf, right? For other people to, to buy or, or think about using. And, and so I guess more maybe when industrial design first started, it was really physical goods, right? Like furniture, um, like, like uh, household appliances, things like that. Um, but increasingly our shelf really is becoming more and more digital, right? Uh, instead of a physical product on a physical shelf, now we're talking about digital products on the app store shelf. Um, and, and, but they're still products, right? And, and I think uh, it's just that the marketplace has changed, uh, the context in which they are being used has changed slightly. Yeah, and so um, not, not really, uh, I mean, I, I think, not really going too deep into the differences between product design versus UI UX design. But I, I guess, firstly, it's like when, when you're looking at, at a company or when you're looking at, um, say, say if you are applying for an internship and you kind of want to look at what design you'll be doing, uh, first look at what the company is offering, right? And so when they say product design, do they mean more tangible consumer goods or do they mean more like digital experiences or do they even mean service, right? Um, or, or are they talking, I mean, uh, troll, troll, uh, something that is a bit extreme, but like 
uh, even for those of you who might have encountered insurance, we call insurance a product, right? An insurance product. So the, the whole concept of what a product is is really quite broad. And, and I think uh, to the example of this question um, that Vivi asked about kind of the, the industry, the design industry in Singapore right now, um, I think we're definitely seeing a shift towards uh, you know, industries such as non-tangible industries, I would say, like, like uh, the finance sector, um, UI, UX, service sector uh, for in terms of what we are designing as product designers. Hope that addresses the question. Yeah, let us know, okay, if, if um, you want us to elaborate on anything or if you find our answers not satisfactory. <laughs> Okay, I have a question coming in uh, directly to me asking if we, if the students are required to pick up certain hard skills such as coding for interaction design, um, how should they go about learning these new skills? And will there be um, anything in place to kind of guide the students through this process in ID? Yeah, I, I can, I can um, maybe quickly answer that. So, we do have a few classes sprinkled throughout the four years in the program that touches on uh, kind of the hard skills, right? Uh, for interaction design, such as uh, picking up basic programming skills, uh, basic electronic skills for the more tangible side of, of interaction design. Um, and one thing I should add also is that as an NUS student, there are a lot of other classes that are open to you beyond uh, ID classes, right? So for example, classes in communications and new media, uh, classes in engineering. Um, uh, so, the, uh, and classes in computer science as well, right? So for example, uh, one class that a lot of our students take is, I think it's called uh, CS 1010, which is basically uh, like programming fundamentals. Uh, and so there are all of these uh, classes in place to help you kind of uh, uh, dip your toes into this area, but I, I, I really feel like, uh, and this is a personal perspective, that university is really not here to equip you with everything you need to know, but to just really point you in the right direction, give you a taste, and then off you go, right? And so uh, definitely for me, I always encourage my students to be really independent in their learning, right? I can show you how to get started, but then whether how far you want to go is really up to you. And nowadays, there's just so much resource online, particularly for uh, interaction design and, and, and programming, right? And then so uh, sometimes I feel like I'm more like a curator, right? Assembling all these different useful resources that I have benefited from. And, and then I just, I pass them off to um, my, my students as well. Um, actually, uh, Ben is, uh, Ben Chia, right? Who is here, is, is also uh, co-teaching a class with me called Computing for Design. Um, and I don't know, Ben, do you have anything you want to add? Because I feel like we are in this together. I think you also don't need to worry about knowing how to code because um, I think most of the students there do not have the basics of coding as well. So you are learning with everybody. And if you're you know, you super into about coding, right? And you can take up like what Clement has just said. I think some of the students in DID actually went to uh, pick up CS1010 on, on themselves, like they bid for the module and went for the class. And that's where they pick up some basic coding skills and, and that's where they can also apply it in DID. So having a bit of coding skills would be able to help you, you know, make your prototype uh, come alive. So your, your prototypes can be, you know, experienceable, you know, people, people uh, input some, uh, you know, some inputs or pick up something and then something would happen in uh, correspond to whoever they, uh, they have coded. Yeah, so in that sense, uh, do not have to worry so much. You know, we will bring you through the, the, the learnings. Mm. Yeah, maybe, maybe it would be nice to hear also from Pras, from a student's perspective, right? Do you have any words of advice for anyone who might find this very daunting lah, you know, there's so many hard skills, right, to pick up in year one. Do you have any advice? <laughs> uh, maybe I can just share from my own experience, maybe. Um, so I think the 
first few kind of things I learned, those are hard skills for like Photoshop, right? Like, kind of like a bread and butter kind of thing, like Photoshop, Illustrator, um, and then Rhino, which is a 3D modeling tool. Uh, I knew a bit of coding prior. Um, I did it like, like a hobby. Um, and I wouldn't say that like super duper good at it, like, like, a, like a coding student kind of like good at it, but like um, I enjoyed the process of learning. So I think that made it easier along the way. Um, and I think if you just break it down um, into it's or like you try to like use what you learn in what, what you're actually applying for at like some project, right? Then it becomes, it makes the learning more meaningful and purpose driven. Like I felt like, um, I don't know, in JC, I didn't feel like the, that the learning was very purpose driven. Like it was like learning for the sake of learning, like trigo, like you just like learning for it there. Um, but like, I felt like it's a reason to why I'm learning um, this specific coding module or like, because I can apply it in my current project in let's say Aru controls, right? And Aru controls, the purpose of that is so that uh, people can DIY build their own um, tangible interactions, right? Um, yeah, and I think that made it much less daunting personally for me, yeah. Yeah, th thanks for that uh, sharing of your, your own experience. Mm. Okay, so we have one more question from Rina asking if there's an expected GPA for polytechnic students for entry into this course. Um, I think as a quick answer, we do have the indicative grade profile. However, that is uh, meant to be really indicative. Lab. So it's not an expectation of a certain GPA requirement. Um, so that's a short answer, but uh, Clement, Ben, any, anything you want to add about this? I, I need to perhaps, uh, if, if, this is, if this is something that we can get back to you on, uh, like if you can leave your contact, maybe yeah. I can ask and then come back uh, on this question. I, I believe it fluctuates every year, actually, uh, depending on um, the, the intake. Uh, and, and also this year is the first year that we are, you know, under the auspices of, um, you know, CDE, the College of Design and Engineering. So I, I do believe that is going to uh, shift things slightly. Uh, I'm not sure how, because we are actually still in the middle of the admissions process. So I need to, um, yeah, it, it's not something that I can say definitively, but I, I will say that once you make the cutoff and once you receive the, uh, your your application, including your interview, right? Your recorded interview. Uh, typically, I know, I, I, and I, I think I speak for a lot of my colleagues that when we assess the interview, we almost never really care so much about the that that cutoff column because we we are then really paying attention to your performance during the interview, right? So, I would really encourage you all to uh, for those of you who are applying to really focus on the interview once you make that cutoff. Uh, because that's what we're looking out for. Hmm. That actually leads us quite nicely into um, the next question about how do you spot that potential right, for, for the course in interviewees and through their portfolios? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. Uh, I think in, in general, we are really looking out for uh, how a person thinks um, and how a person is is reflecting and talking through uh, the design you know challenge that they were given right and and also how a person um, talks about themselves right how, how they carry themselves how they present themselves and how they kind of communicate their ideas so um, it's I mean, don't get me wrong, right? It is very much about communication, but but beyond just how well you present yourself, I think we're really trying to to uh, see if we can see how the gears are moving, right? Underneath your, like in, in your head, right? How is this person thinking? How is this person observing the world, uh, proposing how this this world can be designed better, right? For, for example, and and there's really no right or wrong answer, but we're really looking for critical reflection, critical thinking. Um, and one that is not just uh, uh, 
for lack of a better word, like being critical for the sake of being critical or like thinking too much, but really one that is grounded upon uh, what they, what, what they uh, see in the real world and what was put in front of them, right? Um, and so uh, I think this is something that we teach in design thinking, which if you come in as a, as a first year, you would take it, right? Uh, design is a very action biased discipline. And we always accompany what we think with what we do, right? So th doing informs our thinking and vice versa. And we want to see that synergy between thinking and doing. And you will be doing stuff during the interview uh, as part of the, the what Ben was sharing just now, right? As part of the middle segment of that um, interview process. Yeah. Okay, hope that helps um, in, in helping you prepare for the interview. Um, and yeah, uh, we have another question from Yulia about the percentage of the students accepted after the interview. Ben, do we know the numbers? Yes, I can share a little bit. So um, we're thinking in about, I mean, it fluctuates every year, but we're thinking about 20 to 25% of people who went for the interview. And that's the the kind of like ongoing trend for the last few years and those people who you know make it through the interview will definitely uh, secure a seat in, in the class okay i think that is all the questions on my end ben do you have any no no more okay okay i guess we can we still have a little bit of time if somebody wants to ask just maybe one last question and um yeah i guess i don't know in the meantime perhaps i originally had this this uh question planned for but i don't know whether it's uh it's it's useful to answer at this juncture um but it was kind of like how does how would it differ right if i take uh design and focusing a lot on this tinkering stuff versus taking on a full-on engineering course. What was the question, Desiree? Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying, I was trying to attend to my head and then I lost top of my Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, I, so for example, if I were a student, right, who I'm quite interested in engineering, but at the same time also maybe designing for kind of engineering mechanisms or, or things like that. And since, you know, that there's opportunity, right, to, to engage in some of these tinkering projects in ID, then how does it, what's the key difference, like, I guess, between taking ID uh, versus a full-on engineering course? Mm. Okay. Um, I... I will answer this question with a little bit of fear that I am speaking on behalf of my engineering colleagues who, who are definitely the best people to also be in this room to answer the question. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this question from, from the perspective of an ID professor, right? Uh, and so to me, the uh, one of the stark differences, and actually I... Uh, in, in, my, in my graduate studies, right? So after I graduated from ID, I actually worked very closely with engineers and computer scientists in my master's and in my PhD. Uh, uh, and not just uh, uh, engineers and computer scientists, but also like psychologists, right? All, all the different disciplines that come into HCI. And, and so that collab those collaborations have kind of given me a glimpse into like how we are all a little bit biased uh, because of our, of our upbringing, right? Or our, our undergrad, right? Which is kind of the first uh, um, thing that you get exposed to, I guess, after uh, tertiary, uh, after secondary education. And for me, uh, one of the differences I see between um, the engineering process and say uh, the more industrial design or design process is that uh, I think engineering tends to equip you to optimize and really come up with the best solution uh, for a particular problem, right? And so you are trained to be really an expert in uh, solving like problems in a very optimal and a very, very efficient and effective way. And a lot of the engineering training goes into like being able to like come up with these solutions 
uh, really well, right? Um, and, and I think so, so it's kind of like drilling very deep with engineering. Uh, I, I think with design, uh, if I would continue with the analogy, I think that we definitely go more broad. Even though we can go deep, I think our bias is always to first go broad and to um, think about like for, uh, I, I think one of one of the, and this is an inside joke between engineers and designers, but like if you give a, a designer a problem, right? The first thing that you'll do is question the problem. Like, so is this really the problem, right? Um, is this really what we need to solve, right? Can we zoom out a little bit and figure out like, uh, who are the stakeholders involved? Um, who, who are the people that that uh, this talk, this problem is concerned with? And and is this really uh, where we should be focusing our efforts, right? And so, I, I think uh, we we often begin by trying to gain a lot of empathy in the situation. And and the analogy that um, that I like to share, and and one that my uh, actually my PhD supervisor shared with me, uh, she's an architect. Uh, she's an architect who became a computer scientist, right? So it's kind of an interesting thing. But anyway, uh, this analogy that, that we like to use is that um, instead of straight away trying to climb the mountain, we first try to look around and see if this is the right mountain to climb, right? We would survey the landscape and we would see like, is this the best mountain to climb? Uh, maybe there's a bigger mountain to climb behind this mountain, right? And so, uh, if, if I were to go back to the comparison, I would say that perhaps engineer, engineering is really focused on how to climb this mountain really well, uh, but perhaps design's bias is to first begin by asking, um, how do you find the right mountain to climb? Uh, and, and then, I mean, of course, I think where we, where we actually converge and where we collaborate a lot with engineers at, at the later stages is when we find the right mountain and now we need to climb it, right? And so actually that's that's where we we uh, very often actually, in, especially in the industry, lean heavily on our colleagues in computer science and engineering and other disciplines to help us climb this mountain together. Um, okay. I hope I'm not sounding overly poetic and fluffy, but uh, and that, that kind of answers the question. Yeah, thanks for that uh, analogy. I, I thought it was pretty clear. Um, but we, I do have a follow-up question on my end uh, that I, I just received about, I guess, this relationship, right? Working relationship between designers and engineers or other, working with other, other teams. Is it true that designers always clash hits with, you know, engineers or marketing teams in the real world situation? And yeah, if there is, then how, how do we usually balance this out? And we fight over the mountain or like we fight I, over the ways I, I want, to climb. Yeah, I wonder if there's any insight because Pras is interning right now at, at Grab, right? So I'm wondering if there's any actually concrete clashes that, that you have experienced and how how was um, how was, how was that managed? I wouldn't say clash. Clash feels such a extreme word to use. Um but I would say it's more of like different perspectives. Um, Cause like, it's not just engineers, right? They're like product managers, there'll be data analysts, there'll be um, QAs and, and, and different kind of people to work with. And I think everyone has got their own roles um, and goals in mind when developing the product. Um, and so when there are kind of like disagreements as to how the product direction should go, then, um, we would voice out our concerns that like, okay, this can't be done because of X, Y, Z. And then um, and then I would say that this should be done because of ABC, right? And then afterwards, the product manager would then uh, make the call, okay, let's go with this because this is more important, right? So I think I wouldn't really say there's clashes, but um, there are different viewpoints, but they can be like uh, easily um, solved because I think designers and engineers uh, need to work hand in hand in order to develop, you know, to like deliver the experience um, to, to the end user, yeah. I hope that kind of answers that question, but can we can add on to uh... Uh, Maybe just, just food for thought for, for people who are here. Um, I, I think that very often we like to put, draw a line between design and engineering, but 
I often right now personally, and I think Ben might might empathize as well. I think we often find ourselves in a position whereby we are we are wearing two hats. We are being both designer and engineer in a project. Right. The joke that I like to share is that when I'm with engineers, I'm the designer. When I'm with designers, I'm the engineer. And there is actually this really interesting middle ground between the two. And, and not just design engineering, but like other disciplines as well. And you know, we we hear the whole hype about multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary, and it's real, right? Beyond the hype, it's actually something real. And, and there are a lot of people who are kind of like crossing these traditional boundaries and and, and picking up skills that, that are not were not traditionally associated. And I think there's actually a place, and there's a this place is getting bigger and bigger for people who are like crossing these traditional boundaries. Um, and so just something for all of you to 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 chew on, perhaps. Um, and and maybe at the end of the day, it's really where you choose as a starting point. Do you choose engineering as a starting point? Do you choose design, or do you choose maybe even like psychology, right, or, or like any one of these computer science, any one of these fields? And then, but eventually, know that like when there's a will, there's a way. And and actually, you know, I've seen people cross so many boundary, traditional boundary lines across the course of their career, and that's very normal nowadays. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think that's that's quite a nice uh, last question to have. So for the for the more quick fire questions, I've put in some answers into the chat regarding the first choice fullness as well, which which there isn't for ID and uh, the cohort size. Okay, maybe just one last question. Okay, what's the ratio of poly to JC students in each cohort? Then do we know? I is. Usually the intake is about 10-ish polytechnic students, right? That's right. I think it fluctuates between around 20%, I guess. Yeah. So there's there's also a, a cohort for IB students also. So um, each cohort will have a, a number of IB students as well. Mm. Okay, yeah, sorry, we don't have the exact... Uh, numbers but it's, it, it's usually um, it's around there lah, about, about 20 percent yeah yeah 20 percent ish for poly to then jc students but okay i think that's all the time that we have for today clement and pras any last words of advice parting words <laughs> uh, <can> we <laughs> <laughs> um no not really i mean just just glad Glad to to uh to have this opportunity to meet you all. Yeah, and if you do apply, I look forward to to looking at application. And if you do get into ID, then I look forward to uh, spending four years with you. Yeah, practice. Us? <laughs> um, I would say uh, it's been really a great course. I think I'm really having the time of my life um in ID. Cause I really get to like do projects that I want to do, and and together with my group members, I can always like lead the direction of the project brief. Um, yeah. Uh, hope y'all do join ID. Uh, and have fun with it. Yeah. All the best. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We've also left some links in the Zoom chat, so we have a link to join our Telegram group if you're not already on there. To ask, uh, ask questions at any time. We have some tutors, we have some current students, alumni on that Telegram group. And uh, yeah, there's also links to download some course information as well as see some of the past student projects if you haven't already seen them. But uh, yeah, if not, then thank you so much for joining us today. We have another Q&A uh, on Zoom with another tutor that we have, uh, JJ, coming up this Saturday uh, at 3 p.m. if I'm not wrong. So for those of you who are not heading down to our in-person open house on that day, you may join that Q&A with uh, JJ. So yeah, thank you everybody and we'll see you maybe soon. <laughs> and yeah, have a good evening everyone. <laughs>